you want to start or just the way yeah, it's over just here? Are we all ready? Are we all up and running? Yeah, very in time. Good morning, everyone. I, I've got the green lights to go ahead uh, from Lucy. We're just bang on time, and she's, she, she told me she, she likes being on time, which is, which is good. Um, uh, good morning, a, a real wa warm welcome, and thank you for deciding to spend your Monday and beginning of the week with us today on such a rainy day. I'm sure you're not going to regret it. Um, and we are also opening, I believe it's the ninth Global Entrepreneurship Week or somef something like that. So. Uh, next year will be a big one, 10 years, so I'm just warning you in advance, we're going to have a big event. Uh, my name is Sasha Kazantseva miller and I'm a member of the Committee for Economic Development and delighted to be the committee lead for digital skills and entrepreneurship work streams. My professional background very much encompasses all of those areas as I worked in Google and Priceline, run my own businesses and have been an active investor in startups in the UK and Guernsey. And opening the Global Entrepreneurship Week feels a bit like coming home for me. I've hosted uh, my own workshops and events during this week for about five consecutive years and helped to grow Global Entrepreneurship Week as it was just launching with Startup Guernsey all those years back. So I'm delighted to be speaking with you today and sharing a little bit about the ambition of the new space with regard to digital ent entrepreneurship. Uh, you, as we uh, lovingly know this week has been one of the highlights on the entrepreneurship calendar in Guernsey, sharing insights, showcasing success, working in partnership and inspiring a future of possibility. We are coming close uh, to an end of a year which has brought so much change from all of us. Our work and life have been disrupted, gaps in infrastructure and skills highlighted and the digital consumption of delivery of products and services all around the world accelerated. This, this shift of economic value to technology companies has never been more dramatic. You don't have to look far, just look at the stock performance of um, companies around the world. We all wish we invested in Zoom uh, earlier this year, didn't we? The previous states laid some good foundations for the island digital thinking, and I would like to take uh, the time to highlight some of them. In 2017, the states published the Digital Sector Strategic Framework, focusing attention on the development of digital infrastructure, skills and entrepreneurship, as well as proportionate legal compliance and the regulatory regime around data protection, cybersecurity and so on. In 2018, the Future uh, of Telecoms document uh, was published, outlining desired outcomes for digital connectivity for fiber and mobile. This paper is now being looked at and refreshed. In 2019, we signed, after extensive uh, uh, tender, a partnership with Agilisys, and we are very uh, lucky to have Richard and um, Charles today with us, to enable the transformation and digitization of public services under 10-year-long Smart Guernsey contract, which also includes an element of work dedicated to economic development in partnership with the Digital Greenhouse. In 2019, the Digital Greenhouse, a project which is funded from the future Guernsey Economic Development Fund, celebrated five years and has been successfully evolving to deliver its mandated objectives, such as provision of space and facilities for entrepreneurs, stimulating skills in the digital and creative sectors, providing a focal point for the ecosystem and igniting innovation. Last year, uh, about 200 events took place in the Digital Greenhouse, welcoming 10,000 people, 11 industry partnerships were active, and uh, all programs were at full capacity and receiving a very high net promoter score. And this year, as part of the Smart Guernsey Economic Development uh, contract, Agilisys and its parent company, Blenheim Chalcot, together with the team at the Digital Greenhouse and Economic Development Committee, have developed 12 work streams to further spearhead our efforts in digital upskilling, scaling up businesses, and fostering innovation. This includes uh, working with Blenheim Chalcot ventures such as Avado and Hype Learning, launching a fintech and health tech innovation studios, and setting up an office in the scale space uh, London for Guernsey startups to grow. So I would like to thank the many people behind the scenes that have worked on this project, because sometimes it's easy to think that nothing is really happening in government. And while the foundations may be there, the COVID pandemic has clearly highlighted to the need to significantly accelerate our efforts in the digital ambition. While it's too early for me in the term to present a concrete plan of activity, and I apologize for that, but you know the state's processes, 
for the next five years. I would like to hi uh, signal a direction of travel as well as highlight some values and principles which I believe should underpin our approach. The first one is ambition. It's not enough for us to think about incremental efforts. Accelerated change and growth underpin digital innovation and so we need a step change in our thinking and approach. So I would like us to have a 10x or 10 times vision in the next five years. So not 200 events, but 2,000. Not 350 students, but 3,500. Not 10,000 people reached, but 100,000. <laughs> I know Lucy is shaking her head. Um, not 11 partnerships, but 110 partnerships. The partnership with Agilis and Blenheim Childcode is a big step in the right direction. And I'm excited about the plans, but we want to challenge the teams to ensure <coughs> we 10x our current efforts while always delivering uh, and getting clear value for money. The second one uh, is infrastructure. Uh, COVID uh, has clearly indicated the need to complete our investment into super fast broadband, and, and, and I can assure the public that the new assembly is highly committed to delivering on that. An updated telecom strategy will be going to the States in the next few months, if not before Christmas. When we talk about infrastructure, we must ensure it's inclusive and accessible. We must not leave uh, anyone behind. In that, I also include funding infrastructure. We must look at ideas to stimulate funding into companies and the ecosystem, removing barriers to get started that may be out there, and there are a number of ways we can explore. The third is I believe we need a new, uh, new ways, new approaches, including revisiting our risk appetite and culture. And I guess this is what the topic is about today. We need a growth mindset approach to our digital ambitions. One such approach is to embrace partnerships with industry, charities, other islands and countries. In fact, the last goal of the 17 of the UN Sustainable Development Goals framework is partnerships in recognition that no one can do this alone. The good news is that we've already been successfully embracing this approach uh, with partnerships like the one with First Central Group, uh, which helped uh, run digital skills programs for 350 uh, local students. The work uh, for several years with Barclay, uh, Eagle Labs, um, as well as BDO running accelerator programs. Sure being a um, ongoing uh, sponsor with the infrastructure locally and as well as uh, a dozen uh, local companies that help us run digital internship in the summers, which have been hugely successful. So the partnership for the delivery of upskilling and lifelong learning programs will be essential for the long-term resilience, adaptability, and success for our community. But it's not just the government's job to make Guernsey digit digitally successful. It's everyone's job. And we must all play a role as policymakers, employers, employees, students, educators, third sector, and the wider community. But to end my speech, I would like to say one more thing. We should never forget that technology in general, whether digital or not, is just a tool and not an end in itself. A tool to deliver better quality of life and allow every person to live to their fullest potential without jeopardizing the ability of our planet and natural ecosystems to sustain and regenerate themselves. And it is only if we have those balanced principles in mind that our success in digital progress can be fully measured. And so I invite you to develop and actively contribute to making our digital but also sustainable ambitions happen. Thank you. Great, so I think um, we have uh, Charles, uh, Charles and Richard. So Charles is the co-founder um, of uh, Blenheim Chalcott and, and Richard, the CEO of Agilis, is here with us today. Uh, Charles and Richard, can you see us? Can you see us okay? We can, I can. Fantastic. So um, thank you so much for, for being with us and um, and, and the work you've, you've put in launching the, and uh, getting started with the Smart Guernsey contract. Today, we are, you know, we are opening the Global Entrepreneurship Week, um, and the topic is about growth mindset. So I just wanted to, uh, to give you a few minutes to kickstart the discussion and perhaps tell us a bit more about what actually growth mindset is. Thanks, Sasha. Shall I go first? Uh, so I'm Charles, hello. Everyone, 
see you in the room quite clearly, actually, so uh, you'll just uh, to know perhaps. Anyway, um, uh, a very warm welcome to Entrepreneurship Week from London. Of course, we're in lockdown here, and you'll have probably maybe read in your newspaper or heard on the radio if you listen to these things that Boris Johnson has managed to bring himself into contact with someone with COVID and is having to self-isolate now for another two weeks, having had it. Um, but uh, I was going to kick off my growth, the growth mindset reflection by reflecting a little bit on Boris Johnson, because like him or not, whatever you think of him, he is a politician who bounces back from all sorts of challenges and failures and issues. And again, whether you, whatever you think of him and whatever you think of his policies, if you cast your mind back to around the time of Theresa May's leadership election as Conservative leader, you'll remember that uh, Michael Gove essentially stabbed Boris Johnson in the back and essentially called him unworthy of ever being Prime Minister. This is Michael Gove, of course, who is now Johnson's right-hand person in the government. And go from that challenge and uh, being essentially decimated by one of your closest colleagues and contacts to now being, of course, Prime Minister and having that person as your champion certainly takes some sort of resilience. And I think that's my reflection to some extent, or how I'd like to start my reflection on growth mindset, which is growth mindset, as I'm sure you know, is all about how you handle failure and how you handle not succeeding. If not about lots of mottos that you might stick on your wall about never giving up and so on. It's about your actual emotional ability to handle failure and what you do as a result of that. And, and I think the difference I would say people who have this notion of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset is people with fixed mindsets are never able to come to terms with the fact that they've failed. They can talk about resilience, bouncing back, trying to be the best. It is an emotional state of mind. When something goes wrong for you, you ascribe it to your own inability and your own lack of talent. Or do you go and learn from this and I'm going to do something different about it. Next time I face that challenge, do I give up? I sort of wash my hands of the situation I'm in and say, you know what, I was never cut out for that. I could never succeed. I could never, I could never do maths or I'm never going to be a business person or I could never draw. Therefore, I'm never going to be an artist. What do you do? What do you rationally, and I think this is the challenge, which is if, we, if you can rationally tell us these things, then it's the question of what you emotionally do when something goes wrong. Now, we've been building businesses for the last 22 years at Blenheim Chalcott. We've built about 40 companies and we own about 20 today. And I can absolutely assure you that every single one of those businesses, uh, whether, whether we own them today or whether we've sold them, or whether we um, are still involved trying to build them now, every single one of those businesses has been through moments where we've gone, I don't know what to do now. I don't know whether this is going to work. Even the big successful ones, that, uh, what we'd like to think are big and successful, you know, they have been through these situations where we just don't know what to do next. It's not a question of, you know, when you sit around the table of going, will this work? There's no answer to that question often. You don't know whether it's going to work. And that's the difference, I think, between being an entrepreneur, for those of you in the room who are entrepreneurs, and those of you who run larger corporates or maybe involved or working in uh, larger corporates. The difference is, if you're an entrepreneur, you're in discovery mode. If you're working in a big corporate, you're often in delivery and in administration mode. Now, by the way, there's nothing wrong with being in delivery and administration mode. But what it often means is I'm tweaking things, I'm turning the dial on stuff, I'm seeking to incrementally, to coin Sasha's phrase from earlier, I'm incrementally trying to improve something I do by a matter of small degrees, 1%, which in a big corporate can obviously often make a big difference. It's continuous improvement. There might be a bit of innovation involved there, by, by the way, of trying to do things in a, in a slightly new way. But as entrepreneurs, you are in a very different situation. You're in discovery mode. You're in exploration mode. You're searching 
from searching for the right business model. You haven't found that business model yet. And even if you alight on some form of product market fit, so your product or your solution or your service has the market pull, there's all sorts of things you need to do in order to then get that product to market, all sorts of new things you need to do. It's not a question of tweaking lots of stuff, is it, as entrepreneurs? We know that um, you've got everything you need to put in place if you're bringing your products and service to market. You've got to do marketing, sales, product development, product management, manufacturing, depending on what industry you're in. And then you've got to take care of all the support services, the HR, the finance, the legal stuff that underpins all that as well. And so you're often in this sort of, we find as entrepreneurs, we're in this exploration discovery mode, and we're not able to tell you our other halves, right? Our spouses or our shareholders or our investors, whoever they might be, our board members. We're not often able to give that answer of, will this work? Can I guarantee it will work? So you, so to really succeed, you have to have this growth mindset. And the only thing you know is you're experimenting. Notion of discovery, right? Discovery and exploration is you're experimenting the whole time. And the nature of experimentation is you're going to fail. You're, the only thing I can tell you with experiments is when you do an experiment, definition, you don't know the answer, right? When you're experimenting, you are going to fail. And the question is how you handle that failure, how you emotionally deal with it when it happens. Because the worst thing about failure, particularly as an entrepreneur, is you're kind of on your own. Okay, you might have a business partner if you're lucky, maybe. But you're basically on your own. So it's that worst form of being exposed, isn't it? You're exposed out there for everyone to see that I tried something, oh, and it didn't work. And that, you know, for, whether you're talking to your colleagues, your family, your investors, that's kind of embarrassing, right? You, you, so the question is how you deal with that embarrassment. Do you sort of internalize it and go, I'm never doing that again. I don't want to be in that position ever again because that was incredibly uncomfortable. Or do you go, you know what? This is a path on the road to me ultimately succeeding. And again, whether you like him or not, Winston Churchill, again, one of Boris Johnson's heroes, um, but um, not necessarily like Boris Johnson, but Winston Churchill, had my favourite phrase, which I keep repeating, we, we keep repeating to ourselves at Blenheim Chalcott, and I certainly keep repeating to myself, which is success is the result of going from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. And as entrepreneurs, that is the one single thing I hold on to, which is getting there eventually, and let's face it, will we ever ultimately get there wherever we're going? But getting there eventually is a from one failure to another with, lot, a loss, with no loss of enthusiasm. So that's the uh, that's the message I'd like to leave, well, start with anyway, as far as what, what growth mindset means to us. Thank you very much. And Richard, would you like to perhaps come in and, and give some of your comments about growth mindset? I'm not entirely sure that Charles has left a lot unsaid uh, in relation to growth mindset uh, there. I think what, what I would say is, um, you know, we, we've used a couple of examples there, Boris, uh, as one who uh, continually bounces back. I think there are lots of examples of people who we might perceive to have a growth mindset, but when we analyse the things they do over time, they tend not to learn from their failure. That failure or that feedback that Charles was talking about just now, they tend not to hear it, and we admire them because they continue going they keep moving forwards they keep pushing but actually they're not learning they're not taking the experimentation feedback and trying something different and trying a different way of doing things now to extend the boris example one bit further and let's hope he's not watching uh but to extend that a bit further you know taking action and getting rid of a spin doctor again whether or not you agree with the advice and the viewpoints of somebody like cummings Cummings being moved out for whatever reason it might be creates a new environment, creates a new opportunity. But Boris and the government now need to take that and do different things. And I think for us in business, um, particularly you as entrepreneurs, you already take a bold step. Entrepreneurs take a bold step. I've had three companies and I've had lots of feedback. Uh, I'm, you know, I am now in the delivery mode working for 
a business as we try to help the states work out new ways of delivering services and new ways of improving. But, but entrepreneurs have to imagine that different future in the first place. They have to see the gap in the market and then they, they imagine something into being from that idea that starts in your head. You have to be bold enough to tell your friends, your family that you're taking that step. You step out, you take the first uh, step on that journey and you have to continually learn from the feedback that you get as you walk along that journey. You've recognized an opportunity and maybe the market goes crazy for it. Maybe they just grab it and maybe you never look back. But if your experience is like most of us, there will be learning to be done along the way. There will be, I haven't found a way to make this work yet. And I was listening to uh, one of Carol Dweck's uh, colleagues, who uh, Carol Dweck, who, who coined this phrase, growth mindset, off the back of extensive research, which he undertook at Stanford. Uh, and he was talking about the fact that the most powerful word is yet. I, I have not found a way to, to do it yet. And so long as you're continuing to experiment, so long as you're continuing to find new ways to make things work, that is the most important element of growth mindset. We must encourage people who've taken the first step to work out how they can profit and how they can succeed. And we must see each step on the journey as progress. Just ask a question, even though it slightly wears us off the topic of entrepreneurship directly, but in terms of growth mindset and governments, and you know, I can just see this trap line, you know, going to government, uh, going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. I'm not sure how long it's going. We're going to last as politicians in that. But uh, setting that scene, uh, scene for experimentation, for iterations, for risk, right? Taking risk. I feel it is important setting it at that higher level. Uh, is growth mindset, in your opinion, completely incompatible with uh, with modern politics? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to get. I'm That's gonna probably go. beyond our pay grade, isn't it? And we're going to get ourselves in awful trouble. But I think this is one of the problems that we have in our the way our um, democratic society is being configured, is in that we have a media and commentary act that comes down like a ton of bricks on politicians and civil servants as well who try to do things differently. But you make one mistake, and you are lambasted for it. Um, I'm not talking about the Guernsey situation necessarily, I'm just talking about in general. Uh, and therefore, guess what? That means that we are incredibly risk averse and we get the politicians and the you know institutions that we deserve as a result of that. But unless we ourselves as, a, as populations are prepared to cut people some slack, allow uh, folks the opportunity to experiment a bit more, then you know we'll be stuck in the kind of rut that we're stuck in. I'll well, say no more. Charles, I just want to, we, we do have some members of the media here and Will Green is here, a business editor of Gondi Press and Business Brief. Uh, no pressure, Will, but you do have a role to play uh, in this, uh, in, in fostering growth mindset. So just wanted to highlight, again, this is not just the entrepreneurs, it's just government, is that creating the ecosystem for growth mindset is, you know, everyone's business. Um, Great. So um, if you talk uh, more specifically about Guernsey businesses, how do you see them wanting to apply or how would you, would you like to see them to apply the growth mindset uh, more in that international setting or even in the local setting? What would be your takeaways? Well, it, look, the, uh, uh, if I go first on this, one of the things that we'll notice during this COVID and coronavirus period, of course, is the way life has changed. I think you're quite lucky in Guernsey and that your life on the island is is relatively speaking back to normal but of course everywhere else in the world things have changed significantly and we have been through over the last nine months huge changes in the way that we personally do things whether that's the growth in e-commerce from team to 35 percent in the UK so as a percentage of retail sales in the UK e-commerce has increased that much and that's from a base of increasing 1% a year before Corona hit. So we've suddenly gone from 18 to 35%. So people are buying many, obviously buying many more things online and have got used to buying many more things online. Secondly, of course, we're doing things like this now for all this Zoom conferencing, video conferencing that quite frankly, nine years ago, 
I'm sure our own experience would have been if we sort of roll our eyes a little bit at the notion of a Zoom call, if we'd even heard of it, or a Teams call from Microsoft and not quite know how to use it and do it properly and so on. And that applies doubly or quintuply to senior executives and people in organisations and politicians as well, I suspect, who really, really didn't want to do Zoom calls. But now, of course, are embracing them like crazy. So those are two examples. There are many more, of course. Digital banking would be another where, if, you know, my 81-year-old mum has now got much more used to banking online than as of course she's doing it to start with, which is a big step up. So we've suddenly developed a load of capability skills used to do to now. And as I relate that to sort of Guernsey, I think what that means is obviously the world has changed, but the world has changed significantly and the world will change even more quickly over the next two, three years than it was expected to before. And so I think the question Guernsey's entrepreneurs is how you take advantage of that. So, so that change that has taken place, not just sitting and going, oh, the world will go back to normal in three or four months and six months and we'll just go back to the way we did things before. But the growth mindset implication is, right, how am I going to take advantage and embrace the opportunities that that huge technology acceleration, that huge digital acceleration has created already and will create over the next two or three years as a result of vastly different skills and, and uh, capabilities, the, the faci digital facility, if you like, that we have now. And I think that connects Guernsey up much more easily to the rest of the world than, than was ever the case nine months ago. And I think that's a big opportunity if you embrace it and if you think about it in the right way. That could be delivering your services, but it could also be doing normal business development, so marketing activities through these sorts of mechanisms which are hugely changed now as a result of uh, coronavirus so my thing would be think about how the world has changed and, and and test some of the new ways in which you could be doing business or think about the way the world is going and how you and your own business might embrace that great richard uh, i wonder whether you have anything to to add or a different point of view on this I think uh, I think I broadly agree um, with Charles and the majority of what he just said. I think that my observation of my experiences of working in Guernsey and alongside Guernsey folk is that Guernsey people, full stop, are incredibly relational. The majority of people enjoy getting together and talking about opportunities and discussing face to face, informally, how things can be made better. And that for me, coming from an environment, uh, you know, having worked in the UK for so long before I came down to, uh, to I don't know where that came from, to Guernsey uh, four years ago, was incredibly, uh, incredibly different and a really new, uh, a really new experience. Now, the, the challenge is that if it was different when I first arrived to start speaking to the states of Guernsey, four years ago, it is radically different outside the island now. Uh, to, to Charles's point, um, everyone has got comfortable with, with video calls, with, uh, with you know, it's just exploded now. That's not to say that we can't wait to get back to being able to move more freely, to being able to meet up, and you hear that time and time and time again. But if you think about things from the perspective that you as Guernsey entrepreneurs have an opportunity to sell your products and your services in a way which is dramatically different to that which it was nine months ago, 10 months ago, because people would now be quite happy to sit on a video call with you. You don't need to factor in the cost of a flight to Gatwick, Gatwick Express, a tube ride, and maybe a train ride. You really can engage with people. And technology is accelerating at such a pace that it really makes it uh, it makes it reliable you can trust it a lot more there have been dramatic improvements in connectivity uh, across the UK even in uh, the last nine months and and globally as a result of the way that people are using these tools so not just at an applications level not just at you know a zoom or a team's interface level 
But actually, when you look at the investments that organizations like Zoom, like Microsoft, like Google have been making in their underlying infrastructure to allow this traffic uh, to evolve and to increase, the opportunity is just huge. And I would say that you know, the borders that used to constrain you, that great big moat you have around the island, they don't need to contain you anymore. You can reach across the miles very, very easily as we are able to do today and you can promote yourselves in a very different way now that's going to feel different and you're going to need to learn different skills to do that but actually it's worth the investment and so the growth mindset element of that is learn the new skills think about how you're going to set up you know i'm talking to you on a laptop right now because just before this call started uh, my phone decided to lose all internet connectivity so you think about things in a different way you've always got a backup ready you're always thinking about how you're going to be able to see your screen see your camera work in new ways they seem basic things but you think a lot more about your environment you prepare and then you think about how you want to promote your service in that initial phase at a distance there is still tremendous value dependent on, of course the uh, the value of the service or the goods that you're selling and getting face to face with the customers but really don't miss this opportunity to project yourselves in a way that perhaps nine or 10 months ago could have felt like a barrier. It now isn't, just build the bridge, allow technology to build that bridge to other markets. Thank you, I just want to remind the audience about the slider uh, as well as our virtual audience. So please use slider um, to, to pose your questions, but also uh, upvotes, uh, hopefully not downvotes. We have a few questions coming in, which we will start um, jumping into in, in a second. But just please a reminder, do submit your questions and I can, I can take questions from the audience as well. Um, perhaps one last question from my side, uh, in terms of um, Blenheim Chalcot and, and the groups of companies that, that you own, could you perhaps give us more specific examples of how you apply growth mindset and how you build that culture, whether there are specific programs or I don't know, well, incentives, structures you put in place to actually ensure the growth mindset is there. And it's not something, you know, we are born with or not. It's not like you have it or not. It's something you cultivate. And from one iteration to another, you may be displaying different mindsets, right? But if you could give us some specific examples from your own, you know, companies, that would be helpful for us. Thanks, Asha. We'll, we'll do. And actually, it picks up a point you made um, uh, in, in your introductory talk uh, about enabling infrastructure um, and we believe the enabling infrastructure to create a successful group of innovative companies but you could also think a successful island of innovation and entrepreneurialism the enabling infrastructure yes there's lots of tangible physical things like digital greenhouses and incubation space very important by the way where people can meet and have space and so on and yes broadband and digital connectivity and so on but actually of course is the enabling infrastructure are the skills that you need um, and so i'd answer i'll give you some specific examples in a second of how to think about applying those skills but at Blenheim Child we have a program called bc build uh, that uh, we put people from across our companies on every year uh, it's a six-month program and we run a cohort of people through it and it's all about learning how to build businesses um, and we're typically taking we're taking high potential people from across the portfolio a group of about 40 or 50 of them and putting through that them through that bc build program now that's a lot of things about marketing sales product market fit accounting and so on but the most important part of that uh, program is something we call productive reasoning and uh, i won't go into gory detail about productive reasoning but essentially it is this notion uh, that we all have opinions and views on things uh we've all got them sitting in the room i can see i'm sure you've got an opinion of me right now and i'm talking nonsense or not talking nonsense um i can't tell by the way just so you know what you're thinking i don't know okay um the only reason the only way i can understand that is by sitting down talking to you and asking you that question asking your question what you're thinking and why and saying you don't know what i'm thinking either at the moment um, 
And the only way you can understand what I'm thinking is by sitting there with me and asking me the question of what I'm thinking and why I'm thinking it. And one of the so one of the most important programs we put people through is this productive reasoning program, where we're really trying to say, don't operate at an opinion and a viewpoint level. Open yourself up to being asked the question of why you think the way you do about a particular topic. Why have you concluded that? Because it's even more important when you're having a disagreement about whether your business is working or not, whether you've got product market fit, whether customers like your product or not. And we've all been in those discussions when we've had disagreements with people about our businesses, I'm sure. How do you get to the bottom of those disagreements? And often the way, the reason we've come to different opinions or conclusions is because we've got different data. We've got different data underpinning the conclusions we've reached. So productive reasoning, I'm doing it a disservice by trying to do it in two minutes as opposed to two weeks. But um, it's all about, yes, stating your opinion, but then understanding the data that you've used to arrive at your opinion. And so we try and use that as a sort of glue, if you like, to help to organize our discussions around. And that's one of the bits of enabling infrastructure, if you like, that we have in Blenheim Chalcott, very specific examples. And then I can, you know, I can, look, I can tell you as we've grown businesses, ClearScore is one, which is a, um, started as a credit reporting tool in the UK, has about 10 million customers and um, is now very focused on financial services and product products as a financial services aggregator. Now, when we started that business four or five years ago, you know, we started it thinking to ourselves, well, we don't know what the cost of customer acquisition will be, and we don't know whether they'll actually sign up for their credit report and um, whether they'll then want a new credit card or loan or whatever it might be on the back of it. Um, and the first thing we did, we didn't know any of those answers, right? We, we couldn't sit around a table and discuss whether we were right or not. But the first thing we did was put a TV advert up, even though we didn't have the service that lay behind it, just to see as a result of the TV advert, how many people would click through our website. And that was a sort of starting indicator of whether there was volume or not um, that would drive our um, uh, drive our business. Whether or not we'd build the product or the service, we didn't actually have it built at the time, but we were testing to see whether people would actually click through and whether there was demand for this. We called it pre-totyping, and that enabled, enabled us to get the data, if you like, and uh, Sasha, you'll be familiar with this from your Google days. But that gave us the data to determine whether we wanted to go on the next step of the journey, which was actually building the product or service. And it turned out we did, but we didn't know the answer to that question as we uh, as we went into it. So, and, and that that sort of that approach, if you like, is very much one that we've tried to sort of build up, um, build the skills of our people around being able to adopt as they build their businesses, not knowing if you don't know what the answers are and you don't have the data, how would you go and test those to inform your opinion and hypothesis later on? And we, we spend a lot of time building the skills and expertise. And in fact, Katie Hudson, who is on the call, and some of you will know in Guernsey because she's been over there and done a lot of work over there. She's one of our, um, she's, one, she's on our BC Pioneer program. And the pioneers come in and we train them on, again, building businesses and the skills needed to build businesses and we put them through a version of the BC Build program as well. So Katie's a good example of some someone who's come through that program and is participating in it actively at the moment. Richard, perhaps more specifically in Agility at Guernsey, the company just uh, celebrated one year uh, anniversary, I believe. Congratulations. Anything specific you're doing uh, in the Guernsey office to foster growth mindset? Well, I think when you're in a when you're in a larger and more established business, growth mindset often comes back to. Uh, and I was going to link this to, uh, to to government and entrepreneurship in a moment. So I'll see if I can pull that off. Uh, and I I can just see you in shot, Sasha. So I'll know whether or not it's working. But I think I, I think within the business we focus very much on trying to invest in people. So making sure that they have a training pathway to try new things, making sure that we ask them, as Charles just said, you know, ask questions. So we've asked people to put together with help as we transferred them to Agilisys Guernsey from the States of Guernsey, what did they want to learn? What did they want to do in the future? What did they want their personal development program to look like? And how could we support them and make sure that we had not only the skills that we need now and not only that they have the skills that they need now but what are the skills we need to develop for the future so looking 
to what is coming further down the line and how do we make sure that we make the right investments uh, in those people and how do we give people space and opportunity to try things now I will be the first to say we do not always get that right and in a pressured environment where you're delivering for customers it's not always easy to give people lots and lots of room to get those things wrong because the consequences can be significant um, nobody would thank me for uh, you know taking down a whole range of critical services because I decided to give somebody a a uh, screwdriver and tell them to go and have a play with a live server in a live environment ahead of a bank holiday weekend. So we don't do things quite like that. But what we do try and encourage people to do is to take the next incremental journey and be bold enough to try things that feel a little bit outside of their comfort zone. So uh, many of you will know that Shona Levy, who transferred to Agilisys, stepped up into the head of IT services role. Now, she didn't know if she could do that role when she took it on. I didn't know. Ashley Roper didn't know. We believed that she was the right person for that role. And she believed that she wanted to step into the role. And she has absolutely flown with support, with guidance. But she is growing in confidence and stature on a daily basis. And I think that's what you need to be bold enough to do. You need to spot people who want to take those opportunities. You need to see customers that want to go on a journey with you and you need to try and take those steps as you go forwards and I think linking that clumsily now uh, to government and to entrepreneurship I do think that you, know, you I, I can't remember who it was I think it was Charles who said look this is a lot more difficult in a in a governmental setting and to use Cummings again as the, as the example and, and the recent elections that you've just had campaigning is one thing setting policy with 37 other deputies and representatives from uh, from Alderney, having the direction of a new uh, policy and resources committee, understanding the priorities of different people as they bubble to the top requires skills and patience and questioning and understanding to work out what right things are to do to focus on and as you take that into your committee Sasha and you look at uh, the work that, that uh, Deputy Inder will be leading uh, along with all of you that make up that committee your the question that you need to start to wrestle with or will be wrestling with already is what does Guernsey need to look like in 10 15 20 years time in order to have a viable and vibrant and flourishing uh, economy and community so that looks very clearly uh, Deputy Ind has done a great job of laying out what the priorities are for the for the short and mid term but actually as you get further through that journey looking forwards to think what are the industries we want to promote who do we want to support what's our view on sustainability you know we're probably just a couple of doublings of sustainable power creation away from the planet being able to support itself entirely from renewables. What role do, does Guernsey want to play in that with its uh, tremendous tidal range and its and its other uh, resources? There's no shortage of wind uh, in Guernsey. Now, those aren't markets that, uh, and that wasn't a political reference, by the way, that was definitely uh, a weather reference. Uh, but we do need to just think, you know, a little bit further down the line, what are we gonna spin off from an incredible financial services industry? Is it data? But having a view on the future helps you to support the right entrepreneurs and make the right investment, importantly, in skills today. Because it's those young people, it's those people that need to be retrained, it's the displacement that different industries are going to experience as a result of technology that, that are going to create the workforce for you into the future. Great. I think that was a pretty good link into, into governments, but I, I'm conscious that I think the majority of audience would like to learn more about uh, business and growth mindset. And so I think I'm going to jump into the slider questions. Um, and um, just one little comment. Please feel free to put your names rather than anonymous. It's nice to know who is behind the questions, but I, I appreciate uh, uh, sometimes in, uh, a desire for anonymity as well. Perhaps it's just a product design uh, issue, right, as opposed to... Uh, our uh, direct selection. Um, so the first question is, uh, I think mentorship and support from more experienced business owners is vital for solopreneurs. solopreneurs. Uh, what opportunities are there locally for mentor matching? Um, and I don't know if that question is more maybe specifically um, could be addressed by, I guess, 
um, Lucy as well. Um, yeah, or Richard as well. Uh, so I can certainly talk about the role that we're um, we're enabling, supporting the the digital greenhouse to play. So uh, working with Blenheim Child Park and Katie Hudson, who uh, who Charles has referenced already, we did establish have established a, a mentor mentoring program through uh, the digital greenhouse. So for people that are interested uh, in receiving mentoring from experienced and rel relevantly experienced mentors, uh, they can make contact with Lucy and Lucy will work with Katie as a gateway to the uh, Blenheim Chalcott network and we are pairing small business owners or people who play critical roles but for solopreneurs uh, pairing people with people with the right skills to help them make the next steps uh, on their uh, on their business journey. Off islands mentors or on islands or a combination? It's a mix. It's a mix. Definitely a mix. One one of the things I would say is it's vitally important that we have people that understand the local market as well as uh, the international market. So it's a real mix. Okay, great. Um, second question is in a David versus Goliath type scenario, have you got any advice to help startups stay ahead of big corporations who may try to replicate your new idea? Oh, it's a great question, whoever asked that. Uh, the, uh, the interesting thing about the sort of Goliath versus David scenario uh, um, is uh, I fi personally find big, large corporates or bigger companies, um, they, uh, I find it they're very hard to innovate. They find it very hard to do new things because they're, they've got a risk-averse mindset. They're set on their existing way of doing something. Um, and tweaking and improving it as opposed to doing something new. So if you're a small organization, your ability to find a, a new niche um, where you can compete against that kind of bigger corporate is quite attractive. Obviously, not taking them on on their home turf or on things that they already dominate is quite important. Um, so don't just think, because oh, I'm small, I can move more quickly than them and I'll be able to sort of compete against, you know, Coca-Cola or <laughs> it might be. They already dominate a category. It's very hard to get in that category. But when technology changes or, rule, or reg, rules and regulations change or customer needs change, there's often a disruption in a market that allows you to come up with a new product, a new service or a new solution that that big organization isn't already providing. And as much as they'd want to try and copy it or replicate it, they find it very difficult to do that because they haven't got that sort of discovery exploration mindset. So the, the challenge I would say to yourself is not to try and copy what the big company is already doing because they'll have the distribution channels and the, the resources probably to beat you. But find the area that where you can be, you can have a unique solution to the problem that customers really want um, and focus on that and establishing yourself in that category. It also has the interesting, um, the other interesting dynamic if you do that well, and it's not easy, and you go through all the trials and tribulations we talked about earlier, and you know you kick off one route and it's not the right route, and then you have to go off down another route. It has all those problems and issues, right? Of failing along the way. But um, the other interesting thing we find is that big corporates, because they can't innovate very well, are often therefore the only way for them to get that innovation is, guess what? to buy you or invest in you. That's actually, you know, a good thing for entrepreneurs, isn't it? It kind of gives you, perhaps, gives you the opportunity to get their investment. Sometimes you can use the distribution channels as well to take your product to market. So if part of the partnership could be you've got the innovative product, they've got great distribution channels through which they could um, distribute it. And that's often an interesting opportunity too. So you can use those Goliaths, if you like, to eventually to help you on your way to becoming more successful. Mm -hmm. Richard, I, d I don't think I, I don't think I could uh, I could top that much. I, I think the uh, or add or add much to that at all. I think the, the key thing, as Charles said, is keep trying to be at the forefront and work out what it is. People who copy your idea will never bring the same degree of thought, passion, or innovation to it. They'll be looking for the cheap. Uh, and quick acquisition 
uh, in a market. And uh, I can think of a couple of examples of some of the BC businesses who've seen other people come in and try and cannibalize their market. And you know what? It works to a degree. They might hive off a few customers, um, but staying true to your vision, continuing to innovate will ultimately see you, uh, should ultimately see you uh, winning out so long as uh, so long as you can just maintain that growth mindset and also look at what that other customers that that other organization is doing. Um, but but it's such a broad subject area um, and there are a whole range of different theories as to why somebody might come into your market. It's very difficult to answer more extensively in the time we have than Charles has done, I think. Right. Thank you. So um, next question is, um, as a new business owner, how do you how do you build resilience when everything else seems to take priority? I think I, I think I heard that. So as a new business owner, how do you build resilience when everything seems to take forever? Is uh, that when, right? When everything else seems to take priority. Oh, when everything else seems to take priority. <laughs> You've got to keep going, haven't you? I mean, when you say everything else takes priority, I'm just wondering what the other priorities are. Is it um, uh, all the things you're trying to do in your business? I mean, I often find that it's all the things you're trying to do in your personal life as well. But, um, uh, you know, you know, you probably have to start the day every day going, what's the most important thing you have to do today? Not all the easy things, not all the things that you can sort of tick off because they're fun, but actually that the, the important thing that's going to make a real difference so start with that and get that out of the way first thing as opposed to leaving it till late in the day and you're like oh I can't be bothered with this mm -hmm. it just keeps dripping and dripping and dripping so so the only look right that's a easy to say hard to do answer sorry but uh, but think what's the hardest thing I need to do today do that first this is this is a particular pleasure of course doing this thing first today on a Monday morning as I'm sure it is for everyone else but normally it's what's the tough thing What's the hard thing, the thing I've been putting off? Get that done. That's often also the thing that's sort of weighing on your mind quite heavily, whether that's personal or professional, by the way. So deal with deal with the tough stuff. Right. Uh, Richard, a question to you. Uh, what are your thoughts and advice on risk taking in a very small community? <laughs> I mean that that is a uh, that is a horror of a question. <laughs> I might have to ask uh, the Guernsey Press to put their uh, to put their pen down for a moment. Um, it is uh, you know, risk taking in a very small community is really really difficult, and it brings us back to uh, a point that was made earlier on about the ecosystem and the and the role that um, the press. Uh, that people who are part of the community, the politicians, uh, regulators, everybody in that small community, whichever small community we may be talking about, plays in encouraging people to take risk. Um, if people feel that they are going to be embarrassed or humiliated or penalised or punished for taking risk, guess what? They won't take it. And the entrepreneurial requirement of a community is that people who have an idea feel supported and encouraged to take that risk. Now there are proportionate risks, there is wisdom that goes alongside the amount of investment that you make into something, alongside the route that you go. We've seen Quibi, uh, those of you that follow the, uh, the entrepreneurial press in Quibi go down uh, over the course of the last seven days with billions of pounds of investment uh, lost, and you know, they're owning their failure. To be fair to them, they are owning the feedback that they've uh, that they've had. But you know, for a small community, I think it's about proportionate risk, seeking advice and input and wisdom from those around you as you go on the journey, and communicating. Right, I think a lot of people's reactions to failure or to a business going wrong or to a loss of investment is when it's a surprise. And if you can communicate to people where you are on the journey, how things are going, seek input, seek direction from people that you trust, from people that have wise input to make, that can also help you as the entrepreneur manage the risk of failure, which in turn then helps the community respond more appropriately if things seem to be going wrong. So 
I think we shouldn't put all the responsibility for success or failure on the shoulders of the individuals that are bold enough to start new businesses. We should support them on their journey. And when things go wrong, we should encourage them you know, to, to find new ways. And again, it comes back to that they haven't found a way to do it yet. They took a risk. They're now going to take another one because they're going to keep going. That's the culture we foster in that small community. Great. I think probably a couple more questions and then uh, so we can we allow for pr plenty of networking uh, in here and physical networking here. Um, how do you see, so perhaps a question for Charles, how do you see the interaction of having a growth mindset and the ability to stimulate change? Um, uh, so uh, I think the two are beautifully, two are very interrelated. Um, if you're going to stimulate change and make something different happen, often you've got to be, um, without being rude, a little bit unreasonable. Now, um, that's not to say you have to kind of go about kind of charging through lots of people and um, necessarily being disrespectful and so on. But I do think if you want to make change happen, then you um, you have to be prepared to try different things in different ways uh, and push things um, that lots of other people will tell you can't be pushed. So, um, so, so you know, creating change, the clue is in the word, isn't it? There's an existing way of doing things, often that the status quo, if you like, people don't want to see changed. And, it, and some people would say they're happy with. Um, and if you want to change that, you've got to try different ways of, um, of, of breaking it down. And that, that means that, of course, you're going to have to experiment, which means you're probably going to run up a few against a few barriers for people telling you you can't do something. Um, and to some extent, occasionally you have to ignore those people uh, and keep going. Uh, and the entrepreneur's journey is very much like that. I mean, the clue is in the thing, isn't it? Something hasn't been done before. You're tr trying to build something that hasn't been done before. You're trying to change the way an industry operates or change the sort of thing a, a customer buys. Therefore, they have to sort of, you have to, if you want to change that, you have to be prepared to find different ways of doing it and you will get some of those wrong. So I think a growth mindset is very important in terms of um, uh, having a growth mindset is very important in terms of your ability to drive change. It actually reminds me, I think there's been some research done to define uh, that the reason that the entrepreneur gene, uh, or rather the entrepreneur, it's the, it's the person who goes and tries things out. It's, it's only a small, small percentage of the population and in, in, a, you know, in historic communities, it used to be the people who were, were not farming and growing food, but were going out there looking for new ways of doing things, new plants to try and new ways of killing animals. They were kind of like the innovators. If we were, if, if, if 100 percent of us were like that, we wouldn't survive as a species. But a small percentage of those kind of like risk takers were, were always, and, and I believe it's it's been a, proven to be a genetic kind of trait. Um, but I would like to perhaps take maybe if there are any burning questions from the audience uh, you wanted to ask rather than via slides, I'll take uh, one or two questions just to, to change the dynamics, and then I think we will break into into the uh, networking session. Any burning questions from the audience? By the way, just to add to what Sasha just said, it, it, there, is, there is that gene. It's also known as the novelty gene, mm -hmm. and it's a peculiar characteristic. I'm not saying everyone has to have it, but um, it is a peculiar characteristic of entrepreneurs that they, ha they have this sort of natural curiosity, um, that if you're naturally curious about stuff, you want to read more about it, you want to learn more. Now, of course, it helps if you're a business entrepreneur, if that's in the business context as opposed to reading about, I don't know, modern politics. But, um, but, but, but this sort of no, this novelty seeking behavior is something that uh, sort of has some sort of genetic representation more in entrepreneurs and others, this desire to do something new, to find something new, which is also why we entrepreneurs are perhaps less good at completing and finishing. I don't know if I'm speaking about some people in the room, but I'm certainly speaking about myself. Where you can you can get things moving, get things going, get things sh shifted, but then the whole sort of delivery, administration, exploitation of them—it's nice to have other people who can come in and focus on those sorts of things. The other thing, by the way, that the uh, novelty gene 
was associated with was uh, extra drug takings, and I thoroughly wouldn't recommend that as an approach to uh, building your business. But um, that was another correlation they found in the uh, in the genetic sampling. Great, thanks, Sal. I think we have a question from uh, from Dan. Yes. I'll, I'll repeat that because you probably it was difficult to hear, but uh, in times when you really get stuck and clearly the answer is not inside, what would you recommend to do? You know, a week off, go on a yoga retreat, something like that. What would be your recommendation? Yeah, exactly. Um, first of all, don't panic. Um, but uh, but there, is a, there is this saying, isn't there, right? Necess necess um, uh, uh, necessity is the mother of all invention, right? And when your back is against the wall, those moments, I think it was Dan who asked, I think it was Dan who asked the question, I couldn't quite hear, but um, uh, those moments are the moments, you know, when you're trying to find a way out that actually you can be most creative. Um, and uh, it's a bit, it's no, I sometimes love, like in the building of our businesses to the process of uh, uh, evolution, you know, you're forced to try something new, you're forced to um, mutate to some extent to see if, you can do something different that will actually catch on. And uh, there's nothing like a crisis as we've had over the last nine months to force you to, to try and do different things um, in different ways and, and force you to rethink what you're doing. And part of that process, Dan, I think is, is also talking to people, getting out, talking to people and getting input. You don't have to take all the advice on board, of course, that you hear, but it's such conversations with other people about the issues and challenges you're having, and then trying and thinking about new ways of solving them, getting that input, getting that cognitive diversity, the diversity of opinion forces you to start to think in a different way. It doesn't mean that the other people's views and opinions are the right ones, but you get it, as we talked about earlier with this productive reasoning, you get a different set of data, a different set of input that then goes to form a new base of knowledge for you from which you can then perhaps figure it a new path or a different direction to go in, or at least a different direction to try. Um, and that, I think that, that notion of sort of being willing to change and mutate and, and, and shift direction often ends up being um, a, a total game changer, certainly for our businesses. Whenever we've been forced into a crisis where we can't find the way out or we're struggling to find the way out, that's often the moment that the business has been transformed. Now, that doesn't happen all the time. But, uh, but certainly it's those moments that, that for, for the businesses that do end up working, um, those are the moments that are perhaps, you don't think it at the time because you're in a sweat and, a, and you're stressing and you're anxious, but actually those are the moments that sort of prove, prove to be the building blocks of the future success of the business. Fantastic. Well, I think on that inspiring note uh, of uh, even when we are stuck, actually the future is brighter than we think. I wanted to thank uh, Charles and Richard. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. The, you know, the connection worked uh, well, which is great. And so hopefully we can tap into more uh, of this kind of uh, uh, virtual events with your network and beyond. So thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm sure you can find uh, uh, Richard and Charles online. If you have any other questions, I'll be delighted to connect. Hopefully we'll have you here in physical form at some point as well in the next uh, very foreseeable future. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll break for some networking. Thank you so much for coming. There's all sorts of other events happening this week, so please do come and join them. I think they're quite popular anyway, so, but I'm sure there's some, uh, some places uh, left. So thank you for again for coming, for supporting this work, and I really look forward to what we can do together in the next uh, four to five years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.